All right, I think we should be live now, Jason. Um, I see the stream just kicking off. Should be cool. good to go and people start pulling in here any second. Um, just a quick introduction for anybody joining. We're gonna talk about uh, probably a bunch of different stuff, but the first thing that I really wanted to dive into is just some tips and tricks on ways to make your code shorter. So I've been uh, the last couple of weeks going through and refactoring and cleaning up a bit of code here and there. And um, I'm finding like a lot of spots where take these big giant files and cut them down to like, you know, 15 lines or something and really, really shrink them down. So I wanted to just kind of, um, I guess, chat with everybody, talk to everybody, talk to Jason and yeah, get an idea of what ideas you've got for this stuff, um, what ideas other people have, and just other questions people might have about just cleaning up code, shortening stuff, and making it better. And I figured we'll just talk about random stuff because we haven't done it in a while. And also testing out a bunch of hardware changes. So you want to say something, Jason, and see if everyone can hear you? Yeah, it's probably a good, a good idea. Make sure the audio comes through. So please let me know if you can hear me. And let me know if you can understand me. I've, I've uh, learned recently that's a problem with my accent, so... Let what me know was that? If you can understand what I'm saying. What'd you say, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh yes, the uh, Ian asked a question about the source for the bots. Um, yes, it sounds like that's missing. I'll upload that after this call. Not a problem. Um, okay, cool, and everybody can hear you. Sweet. All right. Anyway, um, I guess we can just kind of get going. So, oh wait, somebody said the volume was low. I don't know, we can address that. Is it my volume or Jason's? I yeah, figure we'll get this fixed. Question. Which of us is it? We'll get it fixed right early in the beginning. Here, I can turn mine up a little bit. Hopefully that, that helps. Um, and there isn't a schedule for this really. We just kind of, um, we're talking and decided why not let's hop on and chat about this thing. Um, all right, yeah, let's, let's get going, man. Um, I don't know how to, how I want to start this off. So, I, like I was saying to everybody else in the call or in the stream just a second ago, this week I've been doing a lot of just refactoring and a lot of you really just using Rider too to shorten things out. So I found just a, a lot of these classes that I can just shrink down with simple little shortcuts. Um, I assume that you see this all the time when you're working on code and you're working on just normal game stuff you find things that you're able to just kind of cut or shrink or shorten or and you find like well, what i find is i get these big classes and i say big but like you know 100 200 lines and a lot of the time i can strip them down to like a quarter of that size just by cutting out a bunch of extra junk um you see the same thing i'm just kind of curious yeah, um, yeah 100 like I, i'm a big fan of being able to open a script and see exactly what it's doing and more importantly what its intent is as you look at it and uh the, the more plumbing I can get rid of or hide or remove all the unnecessary brackets and kind of clean up things, the better. It makes things easier to understand, easier to read. So I, I certainly make a big point of scrubbing as much unnecessary uh, stuff from my code as I can. All right. Um, somebody was saying your volume was a little low and echoey. Can you just, you want to turn yourself up? Uh, I think I maxed out on my side, unfortunately. Oh, okay, let me see if I can. Um... As per the previous discussion, this is uh, why I'm I'm in the market for a cloud lifter. Add a bit more gain to my microphone. Yeah, no, it's fine. We'll get you. Um, let's let's get this adjusted real quick, and then we'll dive into some details. Um, I just turned myself down a tiny bit, and I am going to see if I can't figure out how to get you turned up in here. Let's do it in in this view. I've, uh, I've tweaked a few of my settings too, so hopefully that'll help. Let's see. So the output of this, I think the output of this is just going to the um, the wrong one. Let's try. I always feel this is like a rite of passage. I've never been on a stream where it works flawlessly the first time. Okay. How is that? Can everybody hear Jason better now? <laughs> so yeah, please let us know if that's any better. Hopefully I didn't just blow everybody out. I found it, <laughs> it it's pretty simple. It's literally, I just had to slide up the right thing, but yeah, I had to pick the right one to slide up. Okay, cool. Yes. So it sounds like we are at good levels now. I need to figure out what those are and save those off somehow. Um, oh, and now I'm a little quiet there. Now we match. <laughs> We're at equal levels. Hopefully it's good. 
Yeah. So yeah, let's. Um, you you were saying you do kind of run into the same situation, or mm-hmm. you like to keep the the files clean and easy to understand. Yeah, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, it, uh, I, I've always loved that phrase, the, the Grady Bush one about code reading like well-written prose. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of a, a lot of code looks like code. And I know it seems like a weird argument to have, but as far as I'm concerned, the, the most the, the most amount of the code I can get rid of from my code, the better. You know, if I can read it and it reads like sentences, then that's usually usually easier for me to come back to later. And so the most amount of brackets I can get rid of and unnecessary functions and calls, you know that kind of thing no i totally agree and that like um for everybody that's watching and wondering what what the hell that actually means or what that looks like i mean for me like that process is usually just a lot of hitting extract method right so a lot of the time what what happens is i'll have the code and have it in a functional state where it does what i want it to do but it doesn't look very nice it's kind of hard to understand and if i brought somebody else in like just said hey other programmer like say somebody who doesn't know the project and had them look at it they wouldn't instantly be able to tell me what it does or give me an intelligent guess on what it does so i'll try to refactor just uh, select all that code and then hit the extract method and give it a name for the bit of thing it's doing and then go into that and find the little subparts of that and extract those out into sub methods and then it, it gets to the point i think like you were saying where it gets to be readable and you can kind of understand it without reading the code right you're just reading the almost like the commands or you know it's really the method names but those are named well enough that you can understand what the flow is yeah it's because the thing is right if i was saying i wanted to make a painting tool so i could sort of click the mouse onto the onto a surface and paint trees on it or something um the the code for that might look something like if input dot get mouse down one uh, raycast physics dot raycast out raycast hit and then I'd have game object dot instantiate hit dot point or something. Now, if I was to show you that code, you'd figure it out. You know, it's it's not it's not sort of uh, unknown components in Unity. These are all fairly commonly used components, but you'd have to think about what it does. If I instead said if mouse clicked and raycast dot hit something place item you could just read that and the question is yes it, behind the scenes it uses an input system and behind the scenes it uses a physics system but realistically i've distilled my intent and the original questioner algorithm i wrote down that i wanted to write now is visibly written on the screen and that's that's the point right i'm no longer hiding my intent in lines of code and it now reads like the actual question i originally wanted to ask the machine Right. Yeah. So you'd have like a, a almost a, your if statement would change up to be like if player clicked on terrain, um, place object, and then at, and then maybe a parameter to that would be like at position where player clicked or the position where they clicked or something. Um, and it's just three little methods that make it very obvious. So say if the player clicked, place the thing wherever they clicked, like at get mm-hmm. position where they clicked or something. You know? um, and then it's it's you're abstracting away and hiding that code. But the key there is that anybody that comes in and looks at it doesn't have to think about what it does. They can continue working on the problem. And the goal there is so that they don't have to do it, make everything a lot harder. If you have to go through and figure out what all of the code you're working with does all the time, and you have to debug it and kind of track through the steps to understand what the point of it is it's just it's a lot slower it's going to take a lot longer and you're going to make mistakes so Mm -hmm. just naming things well um and extracting them out makes a huge huge difference yeah i mean because it's one of those things too that people take for granted is they don't they don't realize how important the understandability of code is in terms of uh, quick recall so there's this interesting phenomenon that you don't realize you're doing but if you've written a really large file and you're trying to find something in it, what you've kind of done without realizing is you'll mentally map the shape of the uh, of the code. And I really do mean this because what you do is you'll start looking at the shape in terms of, of divots and how the code goes in certain tabs and out certain tabs, and you won't consciously be aware of it, but you've effectively mapped the landscape of your code. So when you're looking for, oh, I need to change that line of code where the the object is painting the terrain, I have to add a layer check. Your brain will go, that's the bit which kind of dips in a bit and then pops out and then dips back into more steps. And because you'll be subconsciously looking for that shape. 
And that's all fine and well for you because you've mapped your own code. It's like you've been walking the same mountain for so long as you've been writing it. And so you have this instant recall that, it, oh, it must be pretty easy for other people to find this code. But it's not. You have this particular sort of association with your own mountain that other people don't. And so if you take a step back and try to read it where you're hunting rather than sort of using these landmarks that you've built for yourself, you'll realize code can be a lot harder to parse than you think it is. So rather than trying to rely on this mental map, it's usually a good idea to try to make it read like a story. And if you could, if you could read that story to somebody else and they could understand that story, then you know your code makes sense. And that's sort of the premise behind the whole rubber ducky programming concept. Yeah, I 150% agree there. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to go close some doors to get screaming babies. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, uh, Zacho, in terms of uh, you're aware of what your code does, but not by shape. But I guarantee, think about it next next time you're, you're scrolling through a large file. Ask yourself if you're not looking for a certain shape, because I guarantee you are. I guarantee as you scroll through, there's a particular way the code looks that you'll spot. There's a particular sort of sets of indents and then the way the, the function is laid out. And I guarantee you'll the, your first step will be find the bit that looks roughly like this and then search for the lines of code that does this task. Because it's 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 really well known phenomenon. But if if you just watch the way you approach it, I guarantee you'll be surprised. Uh, I I think everybody should try that. <laughs> it happens. So you're just talking about when you're trying to figure out where the like where this functionality is and where to hook in. Right? Yeah, like if you if you've got a file that's like 100 lines long or more, and you're looking to say, oh, I need to find this line of code. You're not reading the code. You're, you're, you aren't going through every line and going, it does this, then it does this, then it does this. What you do instead is you go, I know the bit that deals with shooting roughly looks like this kind of thing. And you'll sort of scan through, you'll scroll through the scroll bar and you'll go, oh, it's in this rough area because I know that sort of shape. And then you'll, then you'll look at it and start reading the lines. And so oh. that's, this is like a mental cue to make searching through your own code easier that other people won't have looking at your code. I feel like that's also a cue that the code might be just too long. Right? Oh, 100%. So as <laughs> like, I think you, about yeah, it, like... You shouldn't be able to have these sorts of mile markers in your code, yeah. but people well, do. Well, I mean, I've done that before, and I've had that scenario before, but, like, in general, I would say most of the time when I'm finding trying to find functionality for code, um, the way that I go about it is to find some bit of data that I know that that code relies on, and then I will find references on that data and then find the spot that looks right. So I'll find like, I know that this thing needs whatever, some item name or whatever the, the field is, like it's gonna be working with. I'll find the definition for that or the, the declaration of that and I'll just find references and then go find where it's used. And usually it's, I wanna find the right references and there's not very many of them. So it makes it really, really simple. Um, but that's also because the code I have is usually in you know, thousands of files. So it's very rare that, there are big files. There are some, um, but they're to the I just avoid them. Right? I, I, anytime I have to work in them, I extract out stuff and get them out of the big files now, when, whenever I can, at least. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and one of the questions was, how, what is a good technique for shortening code? Well, what I find is whenever I look at a large file, I'll start reading through it in terms of what it does. And I'll ask myself the question, what is this really doing? And it's, 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 a, it's a weird way to phrase it, but you'll, you'll read through the code and go, if it does this and this, and then this happens, this said, oh, this is the bit where I am playing the audio when there's a hit on a terrain. Then you change that to play audio when terrain hit or something. So once, if you read through the code enough, you'll eventually find yourself putting mental shortcuts as well going, oh, this is the bit that does this thing. Rather than having to read it transcribe it and then turn it into this named thing subconsciously just make a method called the thing that i know it's really doing put the stuff inside of it and now you've converted that large chunk of code into a this thing does this thing and it just you'll, you'll find it easier to do than you think once you start getting into the flow of it just make a point of because you're already doing this you're already doing this in your own mind going this is the bit that does this this is the bit that does this you're just not physically writing those methods and so if you can write them in in that form factor, you'll notice that you're actually reading it in your, in your brain the same way you are in the code. It's, it's, it's hard to describe, but give it a try, and I'm sure it won't be as, uh, as difficult as you might think. I think it's good advice. I mean, it's a lot to... Well, let's go into some more just 
code cleaning stuff real quick unless you wanted to hit questions because there are a couple things that i want to make sure i don't forget to talk about like um expression body methods and properties especially for um the default method like the mono behavior methods so one of the things i found myself doing a lot is having these mono behaviors that have like they'll, they'll get a single component in awake they'll maybe register for an event in on enable and register for an event or deregister and on disable right and that alone like just switching those two expression body methods shrinks the file down mm. you know from let's see it, it, by default if you imagine like you have an awake you've got a brace you've got a line of code and another brace you got four lines per thing and then a line between each one of these right um if I turn them all into single expression body methods, I can make it fit cleanly on three lines and be a little bit more readable. That makes sense? I'd, I'd say you might need to give an example of this, though. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with expression me, body um, members means. Yeah, let me, let me see if I can pull one up. Like, uh, I want to I wanna find a, an example of one that I did recently. Um, I just, I got to dig through some code that I can't share and find the bit that I, a bit that I can't. Oh, here we go. Let's do this. I collapse all that out and add a region and just hide some stuff. I should be fine. All right, ignore the region. Um, that's just there so I could hide code. It's not normal. I'm a, I'm a big fan of regions too. I, I always have this thing called plumbing or helpers, and I'll just dump anything which doesn't help explain what the file is doing under that banner at the bottom. It's probably bad practice, but it's I, I like my code to read like it's actually doing something and not secretly how this is actually working, you know? Right. All right, here's... Can, can everybody see my code? I assume it's going to take a second to hit the stream. I'll wait till it hits the stream, but... um. I pulled up some a quick example just to show kind of what I meant with this code. So we can take like these awake on enable and on disable and literally just kind of fit it into three lines. And I think that it's nice and easy to understand and read versus the, if we expand this out, um, no, it just, it gets bigger and bigger and uh, like it doesn't need to take up a full page to do this three lines of mm. stuff right so it allows me to just shrink stuff down and anybody that's not using these they don't do anything really different it's just that if you use the lambda statement and you're only doing one thing after it you can just do the lambda statement and the one command that you want to happen and it does the exact same functionality as having the full method with the braces and just that one line in there but it shortens it down to just fit onto a one line or sometimes if it's a little bit too long like say it was going to fit like all the way out to here. Sometimes you'll see them written like this where it's on the next line. If the text was gonna go basically past that line there for however long, long my code is. Now that yeah, all and, showed, and, right? Uh, Everybody was able and, to and, see it. And then what you were saying about it not being uh, very different, um, when this code is compiled, it will literally go back to the normal expression. So this is purely something called syntactic sugar. It's stuff that makes the code look nicer and easier to work with. But if you took the compiled code and then decompiled it back, it will be back to curly brackets again. So there's no need to worry. A lot of a lot of this stuff, it isn't as confusing as you think. It's just a way to say, I know what it's really doing. Do this thing instead because it makes it a bit cleaner and easier to work with. Yeah, it's just to shorten it. And it's the same as placing it within the brackets to answer the, the question, which I think is what Jason just said too. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's... um, And the same thing works for properties. So you can do that with... um a public property that's got a getter and a setter, right? If you want to be able to to do a little bit more in there. Although generally I'd recommend not putting much into a getter and a setter, but if you need to, like you need to wrap another properties sub property in a getter, you can do that with an expression body property and get rid of four extra braces and a get keyword. Um, and mm. so there's a question about, does it harm readability? Uh, I, I would say 100% the opposite. If the question is, is it is it confusing for somebody who doesn't know what it means? Yes. Well, possibly, but as far as I'm concerned, you shouldn't design your code around the rare use case of people who aren't familiar with what you're doing. There's a difference between if you're building a library for consumption versus writing code that is meant to read well. And if the line is on enable something dot changed plus equals event, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to not understand what that's doing. You may be confused what that particular weird symbol is in the middle, but functionally the code will read 
linguistically like it's doing what it intends to be doing and that's kind of more important to me than specifically because there'll always be some syntactic tool you've ever heard of i could go on a big list now and start talking about custom indexers and uh implicit operator overloads and um you've got the null coalescing operator and string interpolation syntax and a whole bunch of other stuff you probably never heard of but if i showed it to you in code you'll recognize it it's basically still going to read quite well and that's kind of the point of all of the syntactical sugar it's literally meant to hide away the complexity of the architecture of code and make it read better specifically for example the string interpolation syntax before we had that we used to use something called string.format and you'd have to see in the middle of a sentence string dot format something comma something comma something but now it's just curly bracket quotes and even though it's more syntactically sugar and hiding away details it's easier to read and i'd say the lambda falls under the same category it's easier to read because there's less code stuff in the way between you and the code you're writing yeah i totally and i think that when they see the syntax like and they get confused by it the default behavior should be to go search and figure out like, well, what is this? Why does this even exist? Um, or well, what is this actually doing? And then you'll see, like, you should be able to figure it out and have it explained. I think after seeing it a couple of times, get used to it. But I would recommend that everybody just try it. Just try actually using it. Um, if you're using writer, especially just hit the button and hit switch convert to expression body. Um, try it out and get kind of in the habit of it because you're going to find that things just feel cleaner. Uh, do you want to show the string interpolation thing? Should we? I think that would be a fun. Sure, quick a, it's example. one I use literally in every single project, so it certainly fits the bill of something worth explaining, I guess. Yeah, let me um, write a property. So um, here, let me just. Switch I'll, I'll be honest that the string interpolation syntax is one of those few things that I literally wanted to come into Unity. I've been using it in normal .NET projects for long before it hit Unity, and it was one of the few features I was like, please. Please upgrade your .NET framework Unity so I can I can use this feature specifically. All right. So can you everybody see my screen now? Well, yeah, I'm looking at the stream. It's showing up nicely. All right, cool. So if we want to do, I'm going to do, well, let's start with a, just a property. We'll do a regular property that lets you get the tab text. Right? So imagine this is like the text for the name of the tab, right? Well, let's call it title text. So we want to get the title text. Um, and we could do something like nor the normal way to do it would be like a get and then you do return like game object that name plus space um, tab and then maybe you do something else right like a I don't know game object that enabled or active self right and let's say I wanted to do like just a, a little thing here that shows the name of it and then the word tab in there and then whether or not this thing is active and that's just the title in there it's a stupid title yeah. but we could do it like this right the string so, interpolation so in terms, option, that's called string well, concatenation that's literally taking a bunch of strings and yeah. sticking them onto the end of each other that's the sort of the default approach yeah so yeah and this is what i think most people would do by default they just hit plus 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 and it technically has some performance side effects um most of the time doesn't matter for most stuff because Usually you're not doing a lot of string concatenation in your update loop. If you are, there's other problems. But the um, the way that we can fix this, there's two things we can do. We can hit to expression body and you can see the git is already grayed out because I'm using writer. Anybody that's using a Visual Studio or Visual Studio code, it's just another code editor, but it's a l I like it better for Unity stuff. But I can hit to expression body and it's gonna switch it over to the Lambda and just now it's just returning this. So when you do an expression body, you don't put in a return, you just give it the thing and it's going to return that automatically. You don't have to add the extra word. But the other option here is to go Alt Enter and oh, it's not actually giving me an option. So I'll just type it out. What we do is a dollar sign quotes. Oh, I hit dollar sign, it automatically did it. And then these uh, curly braces around variables. So we, we put curly braces around variables, get rid of all these other quotes and curly brace that variable curly brace that variable get rid of the plus and the extra quote in that so what we have here now instead is a string with the word tab in it but anything that's inside these little brackets gets replaced or evaluated at runtime so anytime we try to read title text it'll figure out what the name is and whether or not it's currently active and it'll read that back and it's just going to combine all of those together oh i missed the yeah. closing parenthesis there around that 
And so, so th this is your string interpolation syntax. And what it's doing is it's it's you basically saying where these curly brackets are, populate this with a string that represents the variable that you've passed in inside of here. And funnily enough, this isn't this isn't the direct next step. Going from the normal plus concatenation, before that we had a different solution, which is called string.format. And this is the more optimized version. I say optimized because it actually boils down to, it actually turns into concatenations at compile time, but it's more visually um, appealing, I guess, would be a better way to phrase it, easier to read and understand. Yeah, definitely easier to read because string.format looks like this, right? So you, you'd give it the parameters and you'd cut here instead of, um, the actual value there, you would put in an index or an offset of where the parameter was going to be. So you'd have parameter zero is going to be there. Then you'd take this and this would be parameter one would be the second. And these would just be the parameters that you would pass into the string dot format. And you can see here that writer actually just says, hey, stop doing that and switch to interpolation. So, yeah. Oh, and, and to, to answer your question in, yes, you can actually, the, the way pretty much C Sharp works in general, is any place where you could provide a value, you can provide something that evaluates to that value. And that's universal across everything. So in this case, it will evaluate to a string. So anything which will turn into a string can be put there instead. So you can call a function which returns a string and pass that in instead, but I wouldn't advise it because you, you start getting into this weird territory where you're defeating the readability of it by putting methods in the middle of strings. The point of that should be writing it in such a way where it reads cleanly. And if you start putting methods inside of it, you're getting into sort of muddy territory again. Sometimes I've done that though for um, methods that are returning kind of like formatted stuff. So I, I think of one I'm doing that returns back a um, percent chance to drop and it's actually kind mm. of a calculated value. It's not just a flat value. So it's uh, like I've calculate percent in as a parameter there. Um, and then, well, I mean, well, yeah, I've done the same thing, but here's another thing too, actually, I don't know if people know this. The string that format is specifically called that for a reason. It's not just, it's not string that replace variables. It's replace the variables and perform formatting on those variables as you do it. And a lot of people don't realize you can actually do the same thing with the string interpolation syntax. So for example, in, in those curly brackets, if you were putting in a number like health, you could actually put a colon and then put two zeros at the end of it and say, take that value formatted with two decimal places or two places and then create a string out of it. So I would look into formatting with that string interpolation syntax as well, because you can do some really nice stuff to like trim off unnecessary zeros and do other kind of clean syntax with it and dates as well, that kind of stuff. Yeah, let's, um, let me switch to screen share mode real quick and show real quickly mm -hmm. what that looks like. So switched over to show like, uh, what, you, what you do is you put the variable there and then the colon and then the formatting option that you want. And hopefully it's showing up for everybody. In Rider, when you do it, you put the yeah. colon. It actually just gives you kind of an autocomplete list of some of the common ones. But if you search for string.format formatting, you'll see all of the complicated stuff that you can do with formatting. There, there's quite a bit. Yeah, so it, it, that's kind of like, it's a lot of magic all in one step. It's saying, take this value that's not a string, convert it to a string, apply this formatting to it, and then place it in line at this position inside of this other string. And all of that's being done by health, full colon. You yeah, know, P1, P1 to do a percent <laughs> you know, with one amazing. decimal, right? <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, you see right here, this is percent with one decimal point. There you go. It's automatic. A lot of the yeah. stuff that I think people end up rewriting just kind of exists. It's kind of cool. Oh, and actually, while we're doing this, might as well show one thing that I, I like to do quite a lot is um, uh, make make a, a quick method there as a test. Just do a call it um, say, like void say or something. Hopefully you said say and not save. No, say, yeah, say why. Okay. Um, and so uh, in this one, what, what I'll do is we'll just do a, um, a string and we'll do the color syntax, you know, where you basically say, uh, name in color and then you know says hello just just like you would with the um oh you want to do the, the color tag like this okay yeah color tag yeah and use use the um the, yeah like this you, you know what you're doing I, i'm in a bit of delay with this so i was going to say oh, okay so yeah. you're saying like a color tag with color equals blue set to a string yeah okay so I was going to say that there's there's something i like to do with this um so so do the do the closing tag as well and then put uh, say a name inside of the inside of the color tag, right? So color blue, Jeff, and then space hello, 
So, so Jeff would be in blue, and then hello would be printed afterwards. There we go. Yeah, there you go, yeah. So I've got my blue message. What are we yeah. doing with this say? <laughs> so, so what I like to do here is so just to demonstrate. So this will print my name in blue. But what a lot of people don't realize is if you want to do something more advanced with this, the color tags there will let you write things like blue, red, green, yellow, but you can also use hex codes. And if you want to use uh, more advanced color tag stuff, what you can do is, so say on line 10 there, make a color variable. So public color, name color. There we'll make it a nice, ugly public field. Yeah, yeah, something like that, just for just for test purposes. And then um, above line thirteen, make a um, a string variable called hex color. Okay, and we're gonna assign this to our name color dot. Well, it's, it's gonna be um, color utilities dot. Um, I think it's get RGBA or something. So there's if you write color utilities, it's a it's a static uh, class. Yeah, color utility dot ah, two HTML terrible. string RGBA, and you can pass in that name color. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can spell. Is it utilities or just color utility? So utility, yeah, color utility. Yeah. Okay. Dot, and yeah. then there's the HTML string RGB. RGBA. Yeah, that's one I like to RGBA, use. RGBA. Yeah. Okay. And then we just give it um, the color, right? Yeah, name color. Exactly. Now, here's the one caveat on this is it will return it without the hash required for a hex. So I always put the hash as like, uh, I put this in the string and cat and put a hash in front of it or something like that. So, so hex color you... has hex plus color. And then I pass that in as your inside of your, instead of blue for your parameter. You're saying like this. Oh, whoops. But this would go inside where blue is, not there. Like that. Uh, give me a second to catch up with the uh, stream. But yeah, looks like looks like yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was right. what I'm getting at. So then we're so, creating a string. Yeah. So, so the idea being is you you debug log that or whatever, and what it'll do is it'll use that color you provide and it'll print that message with that color. Um, and what's particularly cool about that, if you use RGBA, you could literally use the alpha channel to fade it as well. So I do this a lot when I'm writing um, console messages where I want to be very clear to say uh, this is, you know, this is a state change. So I have it in yellow or something turns on, I'll put it in green or something turns off, I'll put it in red. And this lets you not have to use very stark, just red, blue, green, yellow, which can be very sharp in the console. This lets you play with the color fields. So the only reason I did all of that was to demonstrate the equivalent of doing this without the string interpolation would be considerably messier because <laughs> yes. you would, it wouldn't make much sense because you'd be doing this weird string formatting and adding pluses and then reopening and reclosing brackets and doing all sorts of craziness. And with this, you could easily swap out the name to do different stuff. Oh, and not only does it work in console, um, it actually works in TechMesh Pro as well. It knows how to parse the color tags. So if you were to use that concept and put it either just print it directly as a string into TechMesh Pro or into a console, you'll get a nice you know, color palette of your choice. Yeah, I use this in something similar with Text Mesh Pro stuff all the time. Looks good. All right, let me jump back. To yeah, this is, there's a practical example of, of how I'd use string interpolation. Yeah, uh, I think there's there that's a good one. I mean, there are a lot of them out there. Just anywhere where you're combining strings, I think interpolation is almost always the the default easy way to go. Um, mm. Should we talk about some of the other operators like Elvis? Yeah, you can if you like. Seems oh, another thing actually is a side note while we're here. Um, when you pass an object into string interpolation, what it actually does, just as a small side note, is it doesn't just magically turn into a string, barring the whole using the string interpolation thing, is it actually calls dot to string. So what it's actually doing is it's taking your object and it's calling the dot to string function on it. Now, without going into the depths of the fact that the dot to string function actually lives on the object base class, all that you need to worry about is you can override a two string on any any type you make and return a new message. And if you were to say inside a string interpolation, just pass in the car object that you've made, if you've overridden the two string function, whatever you put inside of that will be will be what is swapped out by the string interpolator. So if you want to customize what those messages look like, that's usually a good place to do it. 
I can't do that with objects where I'll print their name or the health value or something inside of the object by overriding to string. And that way, when I say, you know, X character picked up this object, it won't just say character object. It'll say, you know, Mary the sword wielder, because that's particularly the name that I've written inside of the object. Yeah, usually it's the name of the thing that, that you're returning back. Um, and the default is going to be like the the type, right? You're going to get the yeah. object type or on a game object for being the name. But one thing to watch out for with that too, though, is um, if you're debugging and you're looking at your variables and you put your mouse over stuff, you get the two string value. So if you've renamed stuff, um, you may end up seeing those or you, you, see, you can see those sometimes and it can get confusing. It's caught me off guard mm -hmm. more than once. It's like, what the fuck? that's why if, and, uh, if you want a display message i make a point of separating the two yeah. i used i use a two string normally to mean a, an outline of the object so i would often go the three most yeah. important parameters with a full colon between them so yeah. player comma health value or something comma is alive true or false and i would use that as my kind of my summary of the object but if i wanted like a long name i would call display names a field and i would say Jeff the Mighty Warrior, <laughs> or whatever, you know, I'd make a point of, of being separate things. Two string is meant to be a summarized object name. Cool. Should we, um, you, you want to go on to some operators real quick? Yeah, let's do this. All right. So, uh, I mean, the, there's the Elvis one, but should we talk about any others too, or? Um, no coalescing. Um, we can do, uh, let's, let's just talk about those two real quick. So, the Elvis operator, real quick for everybody, is that uh, the question mark dot, right? So there's, I, I, I can think of a couple of different ones, for example, but I would hit that one first. And all that's really doing is checking for null before running what's after the dot, right? So when you see that littered throughout the code, um, it's really just kind of converting in a null check. Um, you want to briefly talk about that? And I'll show a real quick example of the code. Yeah, so so this this tends to come up as um, a example of something. I'd say it probably originated a lot with events. So normally, when you when you use events, you end up having so so an event without going into too much with this too. An event is basically a list of methods to call when something happens, and because it's a list of objects that you want to call, you can have nothing in it. And so if you call an event and just say run event or invoke event. It could throw an exception because there's nothing in it. There's, it's a list of no things to do. It can be null. So what you can do is you say, if the event isn't null, then do this thing. And um, that can be sort of a, a, a very verbose check for something that realistically you don't need to see. So instead, you can do exactly what's written here on line 75, which is you just question mark dot invoke. And that's a long form way of saying, if on selected changed is not equal to null, then call the function on select change dot invoke code executability. And you could write it the long way, or you could write it this way. They are interchangeable. And when the code's compiled down, it will yep. go back to being an if null check. It'll be exactly that in code. But the thing is, that's the whole point of having compilers, is compilers are smart enough to take uh, syntactically cleaner code and then put it back into the more complex version later. So. I personally prefer the version that doesn't have a giant extra line of code for no reason. Yep. So it's up to you. <laughs> Whichever way you prefer, personally, I like to get rid of it. Yeah, and we just go to this. And the invoke, by the way, is just a um, event thing. That's not something that you would add on every null coalescing. It's uh, when you're calling the event like this. Invoke is just a property on the, on the um, event or a method on the event, I guess. Um, another example would be, let's just go back real quick. Like we could do something like UI codex dot um, here. Let, let, let's do it like this. So say we wanted to guess what the, we wanted to get what the selected page of this codex is, which is the book of spells, right? So to get the selected page and this is going to be a number, I'll just call it var, but it's going to be a number and we do UI codex question mark dot current page. And we could get the current page if we have a codex. If we don't have a codex, we're actually going to get null. That's why right here it's showing a null. Um, and then if I put this to be an int, we'd actually get an exception. So what's happening here is let's go back to it. Um, here it's going to get the current page, but then it can't 
give us back an integer if the current page isn't available because UI codex is null, right? So the thing I was trying to show off here and doing a terrible job of explaining the words is we can add our default right here and assign it to like a one or a zero. So what will happen in this case is our selected page will either get set to the UI codex's current page, which is just an integer, um, or it'll get set to one if the UI codex is null. Um, there's a little error message here, a warning that I wanna talk about, but first, do you wanna just briefly explain what I just wrote there in code? Um, Oh, me or, me or you? Oh, you're... Yeah, go ahead. No, I wanted to let you kind of just jump in. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so <laughs> so basically the double question mark, the fancy name for that one. So so the, the, we'll start with the, the question mark dot, as as uh, Jason said, is, is the Elvis operator, otherwise known as the null check. Uh, and it's effectively saying, use this next thing if I'm not null. But the other thing is double question mark is basically an evaluation of an expression. It is saying it's a thing on the left evaluate. So, so remember I said earlier, anytime something uh, evaluates or something, it can be used in place of that thing. So all this is saying is if the thing, the equation or the statement or the object on the left side of this double question marks evaluates to null, then don't use it. Use the thing on the right instead. Otherwise, use it. So this is a fancy way of saying if that whole equation, it turns into something that isn't null, great, use it. Otherwise, default to the thing on the right. So it's a really nice way of not having to write like three lines of code to say, use this thing, did it come out as null? It did come out as null, okay, set it to one instead. Otherwise, use the thing that was originally there. It's a long kind of convoluted way of basically saying this thing, otherwise default to this thing. It's a much nicer syntax. End up with one line instead of four or six lines of code that are trying to do that, that same thing, right? Yeah. Um, but there, there is an issue here, right? This. Uh, yeah, Unity specific issue, unfortunately, in some of this stuff. Yeah, I think it's important to call it out because it's um it's something that can catch people off guard. So if you look in Rider, it'll actually warn you and say that using the question mark dot on the type deriving from Unity engine object, which just means a, a mono behavior, um, bypasses the lifetime check. So w what it's really saying is that if this game object, this UI codex object, is destroyed, it's possible for it to not be null yet and not give us a value here. And what we would actually end up getting is a null reference exception because it would say it's not null, wouldn't know it's null, it would try to read it and then it would blow up. So it wants us to add a null check here. Um, so the question mark dot doesn't necessarily work great um, in this case. And instead yeah. we can switch over so, to- So, so kind of the, the general golden rule here is if you're dealing with Unity types, just don't use question mark dot. If it extends from Unity Engine dot anything, dot object, dot component, dot, or is a model behavior, just don't use the question mark dot because Unity is doing their own magic for overloading how null works to deal with garbage collection. So okay. instead, use it for simpler types. Use it for your own objects and use it for things like events. Yeah. Uh, that's I'd say, the general rule to keep it safe. You can use it on other things and it will work most of the time, but then when it breaks and it doesn't work, it's a pain to figure out why it didn't work all because um, a question mark instead of a null check. So yeah. I would just avoid it for game objects just because you don't want to have to debug it later when something goes wrong. Um, it yeah, may work totally to, fine. Um, Your flow to might be totally CHPB's fine with it, question. but stuff falls apart. Um, if, if it throws an exception, the exception will still be thrown. So the code is still evaluating the, it's evaluating the equation and deciding if it comes out as null. And uh, fun fact, this is actually also true with um, if statements. So here, here's something I think is probably worth pointing out while we're here. It's a bit of a sidetrack, but it might be worth mentioning. Uh, just make a function there that returns a Boolean, uh, oh, Jason. Just real quick, can we just tell them what this is doing? Oh, the, I, did, um, I hit the button to convert the it real operator. quick. And I, yeah, and sorry. Explain. Yeah, so so this one um, is the this this is actually a condensed uh, if else, so to speak. So um, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm watching the stream and also talking. It's it's, it's, I'm getting a bit of delay, so I, I I'm missing out some of the stuff. I don't mean to be in, interrupted. I didn't say anything about it either. <laughs> I just changed <laughs> the code and assumed you would. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so sorry. This is so so this one here is um, the ternary operator, and ternary is basically do the equation on the left, and it will evaluate either true or false. It has to be an equation; it'll have to evaluate eventually the true or false. So this this could be something if i is greater than six, or if this equals true, or if this is not null. It doesn't matter what it is; it's a standard if statement that will evaluate the true or false. 
If yeah, it's true, it checks it. left if side, this if null. it's false, right side. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah, so when it's not null, we'll use the current page. When it is null, we'll use that second option of one. Okay, now let's go on to making the method. I just want to make sure everybody didn't yeah. see this and get confused and go, what the hell is that? That's probably, probably a good idea. And also, just while we're here, too, just a very, very good warning. People can get trigger happy with this stuff. We've just shown three or four different ways to mash multiple if statements into one line. Do not, under pain of death, put a ternary operator inside of a ternary operator. The worst yeah. thing you can do is if this equals true, question mark, if this equals true, question mark, this thing, full colon, full colon, you end up getting into this mess of just hard to read garbage. I've seen some that this were like a page in line long. Of statement once. Yeah, and pe people get so proud of their insanely impossible to understand page long ternary operator. And you're like, yeah, it's probably broken. It probably doesn't work <laughs> right. And I couldn't tell yeah. you. <laughs> like, so when we're talking about making your code shorter and making it fit on one line, we mean while still readable. Yes. If you if you if you think you're proud of writing this, I got all of my code squished into one line. Ask yourself if you can actually read it and parse it. And quite frankly, if it takes if it takes more effort to read it now than it was before, don't do it. It should right, it's going to be used out. in cases where you can effectively see. See, in this case, for example, this this all of this on the right evaluates to one word. What does all of that do? It gets the selected page. It's doing some internal logic to say if the page is this, that, or the other. Switch to a default number, blah blah blah. But the, all of that's only true because we can turn all of the right side of that equal statement into one word called the selected page. So it doesn't actually matter what it's doing per se, because it's evaluating to one word, a nice, clean, single statement. So it may seem more complicated doing it this way, but it's evaluating to something that we can easily explain, which isn't true of nested ternary operators. Yeah, totally agree. Nested ternary operators are the worst. All right, so you wanted to write a method. What were you thinking? Yes. So what I wanted to do is just briefly, because one of the one of the questions was if if the if one of these equations, for example, this uh, codex not equal to null thing, it, it, if one of those lines um, threw an exception, would it throw the exception? And the answer is yes, because it evaluates the code, which led to a bit sort of a sidetrack I wanted to cover briefly, which is if you have a method which returns a boolean and then have an if statement where it's one side of the argument. So if some method like is available and um you know five is greater than six or something like that sure okay all right we have an is available and five is greater than six and you want is available yeah. to just throw an exception uh, well it can just it can return true for now just to, to demonstrate a point okay so uh yeah we, we'll just say so this basically is two statements Hold on, let's make this an expression body property. Oh yeah, might as well use our own advice. <laughs> there we go. So is available, returns true. Okay. Yeah. And you don't need the returns, thankfully. That's the other thing too, which is quite nice about the expression body because it knows it's being returned. Yeah. You can actually leave the word return out, which makes it even smaller again. Um, right. So. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here is, um, and actually, a whole separate side note because it's actually not a method. You could even switch to a accessor by get rid of get rid of the brown brackets on both of them to make it even shorter. But I don't think that really matters. Make it here. a property. Yeah, but either way, it's fine. I don't get sidetracked. All I wanted to point out here is, so this is your standard, um, your and operator effectively. So we're saying if is available and some other condition. So what it's going to do is it's going to evaluate both sides of the expression. But, but here's the thing. If the first one fails, obviously both fail, so it won't run the second part of the expression. Now, if you were to switch that to an or, so for example, let's change the two ands to two ors. Done. So what it'll do is it'll say, if this is available or this other expression, one of them has to be true for this to be true. And that's fine. It'll hit the first one, realize is available is true. And as you see, it's grayed out there. It's not going to ever run that second chunk of code. Now, here's where things get interesting. Change that double pipe to a single pipe. All right. So I don't know if that's, if that's come up yet. It but did. It's no longer gray. Yeah, it's no longer gray. So this is a very small thing. If people want to know what the difference is between double pipe and single pipe, um, single pipe will say, even if the first half of the expression is true, 
still run the second half of the expression. So if that second one wasn't a five is greater than six, but some other function, and that other function threw an exception, it would still throw the exception in your application. But if that was double pipes and that second function threw an exception, it wouldn't throw an exception because it wouldn't run the second half of the expression because the first one passed. So right. that's a little bit of a side note. I only bring it up because of the question is, if, if an exception is thrown in a scenario, what will it do? And the answer is, it will still throw the exception and cause an error, except in the cases where you're doing some kind of conditional statement and it'll only run one side of the expression. Where it bails out before um, getting yeah. to that part. Yeah, so it'll still blow. But, now, do you but, want to give somebody an example of a use case for the single pipe where they would actually want to use that? So I will, but it's a bad one. <laughs> oh, okay. So one of them is, uh, I've seen this used a lot where you are getting two bits of data and they're coming from a repository. So you okay. might say, um, get, uh, if, if you were getting like an item from some source and it was hitting a database, and if you, if you wanted to ensure that that code ran or if that secondary code was, for example, firing off an event on the check, you want to make sure the event is still checked. Another one is a refresh. If a refresh needs to be done to ver to like refresh the data before you check it, you might still want that second evaluation to run to make sure that stuff is refreshed. Because if you don't, it literally won't run half your code. And that can be very confusing. It sounds kind of like a scary side effect though of an if statement. It is a scary side effect, yeah. So right. I I'm I probably don't recommend it. And I think I've found maybe three cases in my entire programming career to ever use single pipe. Yeah. Uh, but it's Actually, just worth knowing that it's there if you accidentally do it for some reason. And even then, it's usually not just a single pipe. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when but it's just it's worth knowing that applies to all of them with the pipe, the at, the yeah. you, even the other weirder ones like the nors and x nors, which you probably never used. But that's you know the little arrows and the. I use um, them every now and then when I have to do bit flag stuff. Um, I've actually come yeah. across that in almost every game that I've worked, uh, every MMO that I've worked on had some sort of bit flags in there for something. Somebody always wants to have them for something. There's always at least one person on the team who, yeah. who loves Because it flags feels cool and, to use them, so you need to find an excuse to put them in your code somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so there's always somebody who wants to have flags, and so there's always at least one system that's got, that got flags in there. Yeah, well, there are some really efficient stuff you can do with uh, and bit flags to kind exactly. of uh, <laughs> stack them and add them together in interesting ways. Yeah. I've seen that done to optimize things like chess calculations or doing, um, if you're doing hands in poker, I've seen some really clever stuff done with bit switching. It's really cool stuff. Oh, neat. I haven't got to check that out. I mean, I know you can do lots of cool stuff. Um, I'm just terrible at it. Like I said, I end um, up just looking too. it up me every too. time I need to actually dive into it. I'm like, ah, what was that one again? All right. Um, oh, somebody's asking if bit shifting is ever used that's, in games. Yeah, it's literally yes. what we were just saying there, bit, yeah. bit switching. So yeah. Th yeah, that's actually used um, quite a bit for flags and stuff. Um, mm. And by the way, for anybody that's not sure what that is, the flags are essentially like, imagine you've got a number and you've got a 32-bit number, right? You got 32 zeros and ones, and it's setting it up so that you can have 32 toggles basically saved off into a single int so you just have this one integer and based on the value it's you know whatever the state of each one of those ones and zeros is um it just lets you kind of comp compress all those bulls down into a single int although it doesn't really save you it, technically you can get a little bit better performance um with a couple things generally it's networking related or something but it's yeah, I don't know. I, I generally don't use masks bit, bit masks anymore, at least not often. Yeah, like there's there's a lot of stuff you can do with graphics libraries and blitting and other sort of really crazy optimization stuff. But honestly, in the average flow of programming logic, you shouldn't really need it. Yeah, in, game, one of in general game code, you. they're not that useful. Yeah, somebody mentioned layer mask, for example. And that's an example where physics, like the physics system, gets a big benefit out of using that masking system, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, what, any other stuff you want to jump onto or should we take a couple well, questions? There's, there's an interesting question here. So I'm, I'm curious to see your answer on it, which is, uh, uh, Ian says, I've heard a lot of contradicting opinions on using multiple returns in a function. So uh, teachers from the industry lean towards single return. What do you think? Um, I'm okay with early returns. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't like to have a ton of exits out of stuff. Usually it's, one or two 
Um, oh, most of the time, I'd say it's one, but sometimes it's conditional and I'm returning from two different options um, or just exiting out early, right? I mean, I can't imagine a, a case where I forced myself to always have one return point because then it sounds like I'm mm -hmm. just creating an object to set it up and then return it later, right? Like yeah. imagine I've got an if statement and I go, if, if it's one, I want to return the first thing. If it's two, I want to return the second thing. Um, I don't want to like create an object at the beginning, assign that object in those if statements and then return it at the end. Like I just want to return back out right away. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would say having multiple returns is fine if you have more than two returns um, and it's not like a, a very special case switch statement that's doing something uh, and you really expect it, then I would be a little concerned. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are going to be some cases where you're going to have multiple, but in general, I think most things should have one. Some things should have two. Um, more of those things having two would probably just have an early exit. Um, or they're just a conditional returning one of two different things. Mm -hmm. now, what, what do you think of that? I mean, it, it seems having a single return point always seems like you're just going to be writing extra code. Yeah, so th this is kind of the crux of the argument, which is that we're, we're talking about making small methods. So the, the this is actually a surprisingly long and complicated question. It doesn't seem like it, but it's actually, it's it's kind of hiding a lot of secret other concepts in it. So the simple one is we're talking about, the, the kind of the name for what you're talking about is something called cyclomatic complexity. And cyclomatic complexity means how many routes are there through my piece of code. So if it's this condition, run this bit. If it's this condition, run this bit. Otherwise, do this bit. But if it's this bit and then this happens, do this bit. That's the cyclomatic complexity. How many cyclical different routes are there through your code? And in general, you want to have a very low cyclomatic complexity. So you want to have code that doesn't have a lot of branching paths in a single function. Now, how do you avoid that? Well, we talked about having methods that are small enough that they don't need to have five or six different conditionals inside of it. Because what you're doing at that stage, you're doing something called case statements. And case statements are check a bunch of different things. And under this scenario, do this thing. Under this scenario, do this thing. And that's that's a bigger code smell than this topic of conversation because you're getting into territory where you're talking about if you've got five or six cases, then every new case has to be added to this every time something changes. and there's, there's lots of sort of bigger branching topics to discuss on this, which is how you solve that problem. And the main one being polymorphic dispatch, but that's a whole different topic I don't want to get into. But what I will say, uh, to, to dial it back to the simpler version of this is, in general, you don't want your code doing enough things where multiple return statements is a problem. That being said, multiple return statements by themselves isn't the problem. A good example of this is something called guard clauses. So if you're bringing in data in from the outside world, like the user's typing something into a text box, you can validate that that input is what you expect it to be. And if it's not, you can return out of the function early, avoid doing all the logic later on. So say I was getting a file, reading the contents of the file, parsing through it and doing stuff. My first check could be, if the file is empty or the file doesn't exist, return. I can't do the rest of the stuff. So why would I go through all the other messing when I know I already am finished with what I'm doing here? So you can exit early by using a guard clause. And that saves you from having a big giant set of curly brackets wrapping around the whole thing saying, if this isn't null and this isn't empty and this doesn't happen, rather than doing that, just say, if it's empty or null, leave. Otherwise, let's get back to the real job at hand here. That's perfectly fine. That is you basically doing, again, a guard clause. But that is very different than case statements, where you're doing multiple returns in a single function because your code is doing too many things simultaneously. If that's happening, you have to reevaluate your design because there's something wrong with it. But if you're just guarding the inputs, or as you exit, maybe checking a scenario and then doing either return object A or object B, then you're just parsing your data differently. Like, for example, you might return a model differently depending on what the request is or something. That's fine. So. When people say don't have too many return statements, that's usually good advice, but it's usually not what people think it means. It doesn't mean don't have return statements. It means don't have your code doing so many things that you need to have lots of return statements, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, I think you kind of nailed it there that you want to have multiple return statements in a lot of cases. Just if you have multiple and it's getting called out, there are probably way too many. And there's probably way too much in those methods. They're probably doing too much. Yeah, it's a good one. Let's see.
And any other questions in here that you thought were interesting? Uh, well, one of them is any syntactic sugar for case statements. Well, well, the best syntactic sugar for case statements is avoid case statements. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, in general, you shouldn't really be having them. Um, when you should is a whole different conversation. And I would say if you really want to know when you should and shouldn't use case statements, I would look into the difference between data structures and between objects. They're actually very different things, and you want to use case statements with data structures. You don't want to use case statements with game objects or objects. Unity uses game object differently than coding in general, so I would say look into that. But yeah, just, just don't use case statements if you can. Yeah. I, Actually, I would, here's, a good, here's a good example off the top of my head. Sorry, Jason, your, your site. I didn't think oh, I, no, I was just going to say that with, with case statements too, like if you find that you're using the same case statement in two places, you've probably made a mistake, right? N not necessarily, yeah. but probably that that's, that's when it really kind of stands out when you have to go in the second, you have to change it in two places in the case statement. And it's like, and I, I think that's a, a big smell for me, but go ahead. Yeah. We're going to jump onto what you're saying. Yeah. Like, like I was going to say that there's, a common cause of case statements is uh, something called feature envy. And a good example of this is imagine I had a printing function, like I was printing to the screen some data and I had a case statement and it takes in a, um, a character. And if the character is an NPC, print it in this color. If a character is a um, soldier, print it in this color. If a character is a dragon, print it in this color. I've now got a case statement statement i basically said under these scenarios do these different things and if i want to add a new type of thing like an ogre i'm gonna to have to go into that case statement and change it and this is basically going to grow exponentially as i add more objects to my game but imagine if i had a single function that was on the base object of all of these characters just called game character or something or game actor and i just had a method called display and I passed in the source to display it on, the object could decide how he wants to display himself, all of a sudden, I've replaced an entire case statement full of multiple conditions with a single line that says, display yourself. Because what happens is, is I've actually leaked out the implementation. Somebody outside of the dragon or the character is saying, hey, if this thing's a dragon, print it this way. But realistically, that's, that's a feature of envy, because what I'm saying is I want the ability to show how this character prints himself. And I'm taking his job from him. But if I give him back his own job and I say, print yourself, by the way, we're printing to this object over here, it suddenly becomes an awful lot cleaner because I'm not making a decision that needs to grow with the objects. If I add a new object or I want to start printing you know, vehicles, I can just add a vehicle and it can know how to print itself and it's not my problem anymore. I don't have to think about it. And no longer am I stuck with having to create a giant case statement to multiple different locations. So that's called polymorphic dispatch. And there's, there's ways to simplify case statements that are considerably better than having to actually grow them. So in general, if you see a case statement, there's probably a better approach in most scenarios. And I think in your example too, with the, um, the being able to print themselves, you might, uh, depending on what those objects are, you might even be making a new class for each one of these, like a um, whatever, an NPC printer, a tank printer or whatever that you're then doing so that it's not necessarily bloating into the the core logic code of that object but into some other thing that that object is using or knows about so you tell this thing to print and it tells its yeah. printer to do and, the and printing. the thing is right this whole concept of collaborators or dependencies i mean if i tell an object to print himself if he uses a different printer internally that's not my problem. I've already right. done my job. I've delegated to the right person who knows the information required to do the job. So you don't have to muddy a class by taking in all the responsibilities, but you're at least sending it in the right direction to the people who need to know about that information. Yeah, I think that's an important part. Just make sure that they're not blowing it up, but they're, because I think sometimes people get confused. They'll go, well, I made this printer class and I made this you know, NPC class and I don't want my NPC doing the printing and I don't want my printer to have to know what it's printing and realize that it's really just like there's this third class that's missing, right? There's NPC printer that fits right there that um, is responsible for the, the formatting and printing part of it. Or maybe it's the NPC formatter that takes in an NPC and then gives, it, gives out the output to the printer, right? To, to do whatever it needs to print, which in this case is probably just 
displaying a name or whatever, mm. showing the model or whatever, showing some visualization that we have. I would admit that's something I fought with for years uh, when I was learning programming. Is there something very icky feeling about having a, a, a nice, clean, conceptual object like a house or a duck or whatever? And the problem is you're, you want to be able to print it, but you don't want to like muddy the object with print code. You're like, that's not his job. He's not a printer. He is a duck. Now, I used to think like that, but the more I've learned about programming, I realized, what is the point of an object in the first place? Why are you making a class that's an object? And the reason is, an object is a series of actions or a series of behaviors you can perform about something. So if, if I want a duck that can be drawn on the screen and that can do AI and can display itself, these are behaviors that I want its subject to have. And so I could try to be super clean and have a over here multiple different things that handle printing and drawing and whatever and then take objects in and parse through all of it. Or I could just say object, save yourself, duck, draw yourself. And I realized that's the point of the object. Now internally, it might do a whole bunch of other wacky stuff that delegates to different places and calls databases and does other weird stuff. But the point is, you the whole reason you have an object is you want to put functions that you want to do stuff with that object. And so if you find yourself constantly passing your object down to this other chain of other systems and services and whatever, why do you even have the object in the first place? So right. it, it might be a good idea to question what, what intentionality you have between making an object in the first place. And maybe it's okay to put that behavior in the object if that's literally what you're actually trying to do in the first place. Right. Yeah, and, and I think when I said that too, I may not have said it very clearly too, because I wasn't thinking of a, a third external object, but as a dependency of oh, this yeah, like other an internal object. dependency, yeah. This, I know what this you thing meant, is yeah, like I probably a, thought I'd better clarify in case of people yeah, who aren't familiar this with thing the concept is gener of It's usually a child of the object that we want to work on. Like it'd be the, the printer and it's a field or a property of this other thing that, that we're then passing stuff into. Generally, it'd probably be like a private field that, like you said, we're hiding the implementation details of what child class is doing what work, right? Yeah, 100%. Oh. Uh, somebody asked about, uh, how can I blink without closing my eyes? I don't know that one, uh, about uh, link <laughs> statements too. Um, I, I, it uh, seems like it's worth talking about um, when, when we use them and how we use them and that you can use them. Like, Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm kind of simultaneously frustrated and also it, it's one of those things where there's, there's two camps. There's people who don't know what link statements are, learn what they are and think they're really cool. And there's people who have heard the advice to never use link in Unity and then parrot it infinitely and say, oh, they're horrible and you can't use them in Unity. And um, you can use them in Unity, but you just have to be aware that they're not... That there are oftentimes other better solutions for certain kinds of things. They, they can cause garbage issues if you're not aware of what they're doing. But to be completely honest, if you're doing a lot of transformations on a list or a piece of data, they're just really clean and really handy. And if it's not in a critical path, I use them all the time. I just won't use them for stuff that's in like constant garbage generation. Yeah, um, the, the same way. It's uh, on setup usually this is when I'll do a lot of link statements because it does that transformation. Um, it can generate garbage depending on what you're doing. And um, it, but it also makes it so much more readable and easier to understand and you end up just writing less code. I was actually trying to find um, a good example that I can share. Let me see. Do I have any where statements in here? Oh, wait, here. I'll show you one of my favorites. Hold on. Because I use this all the time. Okay, this is... Hold on. I'm going to find one that doesn't have so much stuff in it. I'm trying to find one that's just not loaded up with... Uh, oh, here we go. Resource spawn points. Bam, this will be easy. Can you see... You should be able to see my screen in just a moment. So when it comes to link statements, there are some of the, like, the very basic ones like a where statement. So I've got like... Here, let's... Let me find a where. I was going to show this to dictionary because I love this one. So this is a, a link statement where you can take a collection. So what we're getting back here is just a list of these um, these resource spawn points. It's actually I enumerable, but I think underneath I'm getting back a list from RM Light. Um, 
and then we use two dictionary to transform this list into a dictionary. And if you look at resource spawn points, you see, oh, it's actually defined right here. Um, it's an integer key and a resource spawn point value. So we can do a quick lookup by the ID, just like we would in a database. And we use two dictionary and here you can give it K, well, you give it whatever you want, but we give it a key and a value and it's separated out with this comma here. So let me just write it out again. So if I do like two dictionary, and then I open braces, then I give it a indicator or the lambda thing for the key. It could be a K, but it could also be like K-E-Y or whatever word. And then I give it what I want it to assign to the key. So I say a key dot um, resource node ID, or I could do them by like the X position. That probably wouldn't be very unique and it's not an integer, but if I had another unique integer, I could do that. But I do like the spawn point. And then I give it the second parameter, the value, and this could be, you know, V or value, or I could name it Jason, whatever, and just give it the thing that I want it to assign. So Jason, you see, will be that resource spawn point, and that's what I'm putting there. Or I could put a parameter like the um, scale. So this would be a dictionary of ID to scale, which is like a float. Wouldn't work in here because our dictionary is not defined that way, but hopefully that makes sense and kind of gives an idea of how that one works. Um, I feel like we should talk about where statements and stuff too, though, because yeah. So, a so more, as a general metaphor, one. just to describe what link even is, right? So, link is a additional kind of Microsoft um, library that they added on top of the normal .NET stuff, and it allows you to do operations on enumerables. And so, what I mean by that is, imagine you had a stack of papers. And whenever you write a for each statement or you're uh, looping through a collection of stuff, you're effectively taking each piece of paper, doing something with it, putting it away, next one, doing something with it, putting it away. Now, the way you'd normally do that, if you wanted to do multiple tasks, is you would go through all the bits of paper and you would paint them red. When you go through all the bits of paper again, draw them on the screen. The difference between using something like a link statement versus looping through a list multiple times to do different tasks is what it does is it a link statement takes a bunch of different requests you have. So you might say, get these objects where this is true, and this is also true where they're not null, and order them by this property, and then get me the first five of them. And you might write that statement, but it's not going to do first step, then the next step, then loop them all, remove the nulls, then do this, then do this. It will turn all of that into one statement, and then it'll go through each one one by one and apply all of the different queries you've made. So it's considerably more efficient in terms of processing a list because you're literally structuring a query around a piece of data. And yes, as uh, as uh, Mr. Games here has said, that's literally the name. Link, it's it's a query language. So structured query language to be for, for SQL that he's doing there. And then there's link to SQL, which basically converts the link state. That's a whole different thing. I don't get into that. But yeah, so basically it's, it's performing, a, performing a bunch of, they call it expressions in, in .NET to be more precise. It's not really queries per se, they call it an expression base object, but effectively it is performing a bunch of incremental steps of, of transformations on data to get to an end result. Right. And what do you normally use it for? So I put up a real quick example of the majority of the cases that I use link for are filtering. It's getting a selection that matches some criteria, like mm -hmm. you're taking the values, uh, this list of resource spawn points or the enumerable from the dictionary, all of the possible values, and just returning back all of the ones where the scale is greater than one and the notes are not empty, right? And it has some notes and then turning that into a list because to list is also a, a link command, right? Um, what are yeah. some other cases that you use it for uh, commonly? One of them, probably the main ones is one, I like removing nulls from stuff. It's really handy to be able to take a list and say we're not null and then perform some calculation on all the things that are left over. You don't have to muddy your code with null checks. Just like um, this, right? So we do, yeah. a, I just changed the code to show exactly what that looks like. Filter yeah, out nulls. Yeah. Uh, another one I do it a lot for is uh, for flattening data. So say, for example, I get a list of users from some database, and I want to say, select all the users. But all I care about is their uh, their full name. But the database object is a user which contains a field called first name and a field called last name. I could say, select, um, and I could I could say, select objects from that users list, 
and I could create a new string for each one of just the two names mashed together. And it becomes a new object, right? I convert a list of users into a list of strings because I've collapsed that data and I've flattened it to a new format that I want. Um, and a very good example of this would be um, if you're using any kind of data binding. So you take an object in one format and then you pass it into a convert function that spits it out in a new format and it returns a list that way. So I could say, select all from this list and convert them and then get the end results and spit them out the other end. So you can use Lake to sort of inline a lot of conversions of multiple objects. And um, I just said, um, I changed our code example here to do that select. So it's yeah, I'm doing go. it after the where and just pulling out the um, just the notes. So instead of returning back that list of resource spawn points, we just get a list of all of the notes. Yeah. Uh, and probably one of the last ones too is sometimes you want to mess with the elements in a list. And so what you can do is you could take the objects and say um, dot skip five dot take three. So you could say, take that list of objects, skip the first five of them, and only take three from after that five. So you can do some really nice stuff like that without doing weird stuff. Or you can do some really funky stuff like if you're using Lambda expressions, uh, not Lambdas, um, what was I getting at the um, modus operator? You can effectively say uh, select from this modal some number, and you can effectively say take every second element from this list, or take oh, okay. every third element from this list, or something. You can do kind of fun stuff like that, which sort of condenses collections. Yeah, and I've used the skip in uh, paging stuff before, but usually what happens is I'll put it in there as a placeholder and then eventually with paging it's one of those things where I, I want it to be um, allocation free and pretty fast so usually I'll end up optimizing it out later but it's one of the easy ways to do really simple paging or if you have paging where it's not going to be an allocation problem it, it's a very simple way to do it yeah. um, there's one other thing that I, I think is worth mentioning too which is the first or default because it's one of the other things oh, you use yeah. all the time and it's when you want to find an object in there so if you just want like a single thing back like Let's just say that I only wanted to get back like whatever the resource spawn point with the largest scale, right? Uh, or I want to get the first one that's not null. Here, I'll just change my thing right now to return back the one that's not null. So I can have the first one that's not null or um, let's see, t dot um, notes dot length is greater than five. Like I can return the first one out of my list that matches any set of criteria. Um, a lot of the time it's, there's only one that matches the criteria and I'm just trying mm -hmm. to find that one by some unique ID or string or key or something. But um, sometimes you just wanna search and just find the first thing. But there's also a last or default too. And default just returns null for an object or whatever the default is for that type. Yeah, and there's loads of other stuff too we haven't even touched on. Like there's um, uh, aggregate where you can take a whole lot of things and take the value spat out from one, use it as an input to the next. And you or can the sort sum of like or the average of sums things. of values or get the the, the 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 character in this collection with the strong with the most health or another fun one is there's one called group by and it lets you pick a property and it returns the object as a grouping underneath the headers of the group by property so you could say select all from select all characters in game where uh, birth city equals or, or group by birth city. And then you could say for each character in, and you could group by it and you end up having like, if you wanted to make nice lists that are displayed neatly, um, that's one cool feature you can do. Yeah, um, I use that one quite a bit yeah. too, the, uh, the group by. Oh, here's a super chat, thanks. Yeah, that, there's a whole load of cool features like that. It's, um, I, I guess the, the point that other people mentioned though is true. Um, Link is one of those things which it shouldn't be used in critical path calculations. Right. So if you're doing something where you're doing um, some AI and you're comparing distances of objects, or you're doing a whole load of checks against neighboring things, or doing some kind of projectile calculations, you probably don't want to use it there. Um, right. You probably want to do it when you're like, I use it a lot when I read in a chunk of data. So for example, I wrote something earlier today, which was getting a whole bunch of names and generating fake users. And so I was taking that text file, reading it in, and I would be using link statements to parse that list and split it up and then to use it to like shuffle the list and that kind of stuff in my awake function, and then I won't do it again. I now have a okay. fully qualified list sorted and filtered the way I want to with the subselections of data that I need. So those kinds of scenarios are pretty good. You just don't want to be doing it in kind of your, your critical paths. Yeah, 
and it's the same same here it's it generally in awake or in some loading and setup path um or it's there as a temporary thing until i work out the final code because sometimes it's just faster and easier to write a simple link, link statement to get the job done and then knowing that i'm i'm still kind of figuring out what the code's going to look like and then i'm going to go back and just unroll that into something else that makes more sense later or turn it into some cached data structure or whatever it is that i need but uh, that is a lot yeah, of the I'll time i'll just write link too. statements yeah. as kind of a default knowing that i'm going to go back through and fix it right after or change it um, yeah. before i commit at least yeah, if yeah, it's going to be a performance i will say as well as a smaller side on that you will see link statements a lot in enterprise software oh, so yeah. you won't see a lot in games because it's very critical in terms of um uh, update loops and that kind of stuff. And I've discussed before the difference between update-driven games versus event-driven games or event-driven projects. Uh, Link is perfectly fine in event-driven systems. There's almost no case where the cost of Link will ever really hamper you in an event-driven system. And because of that, there's a lot of really fun stuff you can do with it in those contexts. Like you'll see a lot of people use Link in a threaded application to combine multiple asynchronous data sources and do some fun stuff like aggregate stocks from different services or whatever. But I will say as a small aside, Link works on this whole concept of enumerables. And I don't want to go down that whole rabbit hole again of enumerables versus lists, but I will just say one thing. A lot of people who say Link is, is bad for performance, in some cases it is actually better for performance than other scenarios. And what I mean by this is there is something, for example, called Link to XML and Link to SQL. And what this is, is that syntax which looks and acts like Link but what it'll do is it will actually build your more efficient queries for you. So an example of this, if you were using a database that's SQL driven and you pull back, you say, get all users from database and you then performed a bunch of link statements on it, or you did a load of for each element, do this, you do for loops and for loops, you will have pulled all that information from the database and you'll iterate on each individual element one by one. But if you used link to SQL and you said, select all from this data set, where this is true and first name is equal to this, behind the scenes, link the SQL will turn that into an actual SQL query. And it will run it once and hit the database and pull back the correct answer to your fully qualified link statement, not all of the data and then loop through all the fields. So in that instance, it's actually far better than not using link <laughs> because it's actually generating an, an efficient query for you. So now this doesn't apply in games again, like we said, and in games, it usually is a good idea not to use them. But keep in mind that this general idea, the hand wave away, that link is like a cool syntax with bad performance is just a wrong interpretation of what it is. So it is sometimes considerably more performant. You just have to know what it's actually doing. Yeah, and I, I think it's also just better than some people's code, right? Like a lot of the time people try yeah. to write these things themselves and they write a version that runs worse. Like it's very easy to mess it up and do it wrong and ma make it worse, especially when it gets to something more complex than just finding something that matches a single if statement. Mm. Um, like aggregates, one of them. Like I've seen people do group buys and aggregates and whatever, and it's just hard to read and figure out what they're doing. Yeah. Do they just use dot aggregate? I wouldn't know what their intention was when they were using it. It'd be readable and it would work, right? Yeah. And the, the link stuff in general, it's, it's fast. It's just not fast enough that you want to do it in, in an update loop every frame right that's that's really the only lesson there and, and even in that case it, it may still be fine just make sure that you profile like no number one mm -hmm. thing on uh, yeah. on every project just profile it and find out where your hot spots are um there was a question oh there are two questions one about blender but i don't really know enough about yeah, blender, blender modifiers blender guy, to be able to answer it um, and then about um, Ryan's Unite talk, I actually reached out to him to the see legendary if he'd be Ryan interested Hipple in talking. Talk, the, the thing of legends, the holy bible of scriptable objects. Yes, because yeah. I'm kind <laughs> of curious on his um, current take on it, his you know, most recent state of it. So I, I pinged him once. I, I'm going to try to reach out again. I mean, he didn't know who I am, so <laughs> I got to like, see if I know anybody who knows and maybe that, that can reach out to and, um <laughs> I'd be interested to get an update on his thoughts on it too, on how they're using it. I've talked about it a bit in the past that I, th I think it makes sense for certain for companies and certain yeah, project types. Done quickly, yeah. What's that? I was going to say, yeah, this for prototyping is what I, I yeah. think it's an amazing prototyping tool. It's a really quick way to get up and running. I think it's good um, for that, but also for just companies who build a lot of the same game, right? Like I, one of my yeah. friends, like they build, um, solitaire games and they you know they build like dozens of them they're just constantly releasing new solitaire games so a framework 
like that makes it pretty i think better for them to do stuff like that because they can just go in they're not having to add a lot of functionality it's more about just hooking up and minor changes and they can have designers do it and not have to change code uh, but they can't do different types of mm. games, right? Like they want to do a big variation on the game. Suddenly that's going to need a lot yeah. of code work. Uh, yeah, by that stage, you're basically building your own sort of lightweight version of something like Playmaker. You're basically building your own nodes on top of Unity and then sort right. of composing your own elements. And that's kind of how I, I, I see that system really like showing off and having a lot of strength is if you have an in-house almost like a mini engine or mini API on top of it that everybody's using. And it just kind of does all of the same stuff that all of the core functionality that all of your games share and do, um, and then allows the designers to, to hook stuff up. I could see a lot of value from that. I just feel like um, I never do that. Like I never work on two games that are similar enough where anything would translate really. Um, so I, I have a hard time picturing it in my head or, or seeing the value of of that system in my head in that case but i'm curious like i, I know we've talked about it before uh, have you changed your mind on it are you all for it or no I've, I've i've tried using it a few times and there was a few sort of not quite game jams but small scale projects where it it like it made things faster than i would have done it myself initially because you had you could sort of like hand someone a job and say i'm busy doing this thing can you hook up the events to this side or the other and they can just drag in the events and sort of um scale it in a way that doesn't require much explaining because once everybody understands the concept of using scriptable objects as data providers or as events it's kind of like adding more is the same pattern it's just knowing where to put them and so it makes it very easy to sort of share the concepts like that i just find that it the the problem i have with it is you're you're putting those objects in multiple layers throughout the hierarchy of your application so you end up getting into that weird territory where if you want to change an object you have to like dig through the hierarchy of your app to sort of find where the one is that you're swapping out to change and it may seem really clean at the outset. You can step back, open a folder, and call it, here's my events folder with all my scriptable objects. And it's really nice there. Like, it's really nice at the kind of high level of the application. But when it comes to hooking things up and finding stuff and changing it, then it's a nightmare. Because <laughs> then you're going down, like, multiple trees of elements in your hierarchy and trying to find stuff to swap out. And personally, I prefer a more signal-based approach, where various parts of my application fire off these signals of stuff going on, and then I have a single place where I listen and hook it up. Does it require more coding knowledge to do that? Yes. Is it harder to sort of extend rapidly? Yes. But does it give you the same level of freedom without kind of tying you to this sort of architectural vendor system of using suitable objects? That's kind of the benefit that I get from it. it. It gives me a lot of the same benefits, but without sort of leaning too heavily on this sort of like using the Unity inspector as a part of my coding workflow, which seems too odd for me to be leaning into. Yeah, I I feel the same way about the inspector part, but the um, something, something you said there just kind of caught me. How often do you actually use signals? Like it's it, it feels... I, I've seen people use it. I've tried using it that that whole system before. Um, it feels very anti-patterny to me, right? Like it feels oh, yeah? like you have this thing and it's just sending shit out to anything, um, and then anything is listening to it, right? And like all of these things are just kind of like slamming into. It feels a lot like a service locator. Like it's just hiding that it's finding the service, right? Um, yeah, I, I can I can see that argument. It, I guess the yeah, it, it comes down to when and where, and I find the perfect use case for me is user interface. So an example for this is I could create something like a task bar or a profile screen, and there's a bunch of icons where you click on a person's face, and I can dispatch, you know, clicked, uh, clicked on person, and then pass in a, a data object which contains the person's name and the avatar image and an ID. And now I can attach that to a little prefab, and this is like an icon of a face. And whenever I want to trigger a clicked on face, I can put that anywhere. And the idea is I have clicked on that person's face, and if, if that's meant to navigate me to that person's profile page, then I can do it in one click. I can subscribe to that signal and choose to do something with it. So I use it as a way of saying, so the, the reason I do it is if you make a, a, a UI screen, in Unity, 
The way you have to hook it up is you normally have to do events that are exposed and then listen to all the events and hook them up. Someone click this button, someone click this button, someone click this button. Or what you have to do is put some kind of controller object on the UI and manually handle all of those button presses and then lock it into the prefab of the object. If you do a signal, you have an object which dispatches when its events are clicked and then you can subscribe to those signals and you don't need to hook up to events. So you don't have this pub sub concept. You are just saying, this is a modal dialogue which does these events, subscribe to them, respond accordingly. And it means that each UI screen can live purely as a prefab without scene references. And that freedom is worth everything else to me. There is a little bit of that whole potential anti-pattern concept you talk about where it's maybe too broad and it's harder to sort of um, make the events as uh, specific as you might want them. But for me, the ability to not have to worry about cross-scene service subscriptions or publicly exposing a bunch of singletons, the fact that I can just say someone clicked the pause game somewhere I don't care if it came from the main screen or it came from the pause menu or it came from they died, so I want to pause because they died. If I fire the pause signal, I can do that and I can have a pause thing which does pausing and I don't have to worry about the hooking that up or calling a singleton tightly tied to every single script that references it because it's it may still be coupled, but it's far less coupled to say fire pause signal than it is to say contact the pause manager and call the pause function on it, you know? Kind of. It still feels like it's just coupled, but hiding it, right? Like it's still just not, it, the only difference is it's not going to work and you're not going to get a compiler error, right? Like you're still getting, you still have that requirement of if that thing's not there, it doesn't work. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's one of those ones where I'd have to make a, a, a good example to show you how yeah. I use it and see if that and, changes and I think your mind. It may be more than just, I think like um, the com the example would be, signals plus right it'd be signals plus some um architecture around menuing and paneling and stuff um, yeah probably it, yeah. right it's not just the signals it's that plus the other infrastructure you've got there which may work really well with the signal stuff and, and make sense for it too um it's just always been for me like I, i've done it enough times and i always find that i'm just getting a little bit lost in like what's actually being listened to what's being used right um and like where are these events always coming from? And it, I don't know. I, I just haven't found a lot of benefit in it, but I'd be interested in just kind of experimenting and trying it too, though. I, I feel like we should go through a, a UI um, project sometime and just, just build one out for fun. It, it might be an interesting interesting thing to do. Yeah, I'd be up for that. It sounds like it'd be fun. Just build, put we, together we like, do like a really simple UI. Different I think you also do, do like a lot more UI stuff than I do. I, I very rarely... Um, do much menu stuff or UI stuff. And when I do UI things, they are almost always more like HUD elements, not so much menu systems. It's, um, you know, like these things are available in game um, and then can go away. So they're toggling on and off, but they're not, there's no transitions between states and different um, panels and stuff. At least very rarely do I do those. Um, and usually somebody else is working on that system. So mm. I think that would be a fun one. That'd be interesting. We should do that. Yeah. And no, you got to get a list. YouTube channel set up soon. Um, there's a lot of people in chat waiting for it. Cool. Well, are there any other questions you want to hit? I don't want to keep you all day and then go for a while. I'm not going anywhere, but yeah, no, I, I can't see anything else. Seems like there's a discussion going on. I'm having a hard time finding any particular question. Anybody have any particular questions they want to ask? Yeah, if anybody's got anything, now's a chance. Oh, there's a couple of questions about updates versus event-driven stuff, and why would you use updates if events, if event-driven approach is, is almost always more efficient? Uh, because some stuff is just simply update-driven. Like, some stuff is, like, input you literally have to poll for. Or movement, um, and you want to be moving every frame. You, you don't want to be sending an event to adjust your, your input to movement mapping. Yeah, and same with stuff like physics. You want physics to be perpetually um, managed at an equal time step. You don't want to be doing something event-driven. Like yeah. event, by definition, it, 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 event, sometimes people confuse event with like tick, as in like a slow tick versus an update tick. But event truly means reactionary, right? Like something has happened and I'm responding to it. So the question is, why would you use update instead of events? Well, when something isn't event-driven. If something is triggered by entering a trigger box or input is pressed or something happens, use an event. 
you know, something is is not triggered, but like managing the the kind of consistent world state, like you're doing a sun moving across the sky, or you're doing physics calculations, or you're doing, you know, any kind of simulatory stuff, then you're going to want updates. And so a lot of games will have an update loop to handle the user's um, interaction with the world state. So things like the updates and things like the physics, but in terms of handling how health bars get updated or how enemies get spawned, they tend to be on some kind of game event or system firing. So you do tend to need both, but yeah, it, wherever possible, I tend to try to defer my code from being update to being events. Because if you think about it, most of the stuff in your game realistically should be an event. Most stuff is reacting to the player doing something. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be a game, it would be a movie. And sometimes it, the the events are just reactions to stuff that's happening in the update, right? A lot of times the update is what's mm -hmm. triggering off those events saying, hey, this thing's ready. Uh, th this event ha should be happening now or whatever we've reached this state. Yeah, like like a character moving into a trigger box yeah. is like, <laughs> you know, position plus equals something, 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 hit trigger box, event fired, yeah. now an event, you know, respond to event. Yeah, or our time, our lifetime ran out or whatever, and now we trigger our or blow yeah. ourselves up event or whatever, yeah. Um, there was somebody mentioned they asked a question about an integer that we missed or didn't answer. I, I, if you can ask that one again, I didn't see it. And then there was one about readme-driven development. I did a video on this, and I did it for a while. Um, I don't do it regularly anymore, although I do find that I end up writing readmes every now and then for actual... Um, systems so i'll write a system and sometimes i'll end up just writing a readme doc for it but i'm not going through the process of writing these readmes um as i'm building anymore and it's mostly just because primarily switched to almost all tdd so i generally am writing tests first for most stuff um that, that was the the biggest reason i'm not doing that um there were some other ones uh, uh, I, I might be confused what do you mean by, like read me driven there was a, so like... there's this whole pattern on uh writing basically read me is that define a system and then there's a read me for the system that explains what the components are and um how the system works and how it interacts so it's not about like how each individual system works but more about the architectural level of how the system as a whole works and how how you use it um and i did a video on it and i was doing it for a while but like i said i switched to tdd and found that i just didn't need to do it as often but every now and then i still write a little readme for okay. systems it, it kind of sounds like a rebranding of the whole um the, the mike cone user stories concept of sort kind of, of yeah establishing how the interactions of a system go and then generating use well generating the use cases from that and it was yeah it was kind of like that and similar just in a uh, readme file included in the project in the code basically so like at the gotcha. what you would do is put it out like the root of the system folder for whatever that system was and then it would just kind of overview of what that was yeah i, I think so I, I get what you're saying now and so by switching to something test driven instead you've got your documentation lives in the form of the tests which is yeah. sort of a live document you don't need to have a Read the readme has just to, yeah. stopped having as much value and like i said I still put them there if there's a a system that i know other people are going to work with and may not be able to use but i don't do it nearly to the degree it's just kind of like a, an example of how to do stuff um oh somebody posted that they posted the question on numbers what is this what exactly are a new control? vector three when exactly are vector floats evaluated i saw this in a new tutorial a new vector three and it's taking uh x space times the mod of i and y um you could just cast them to ints i'm not sure i mean without knowing what all those variables are um so it looks like it's doing it's it's converting the the columns to gr columns and rows effectively by using the modulus to split it up by the column count and then you're multiplying by the, the space so you're effectively drawing your your grid right from right from the vectors um i don't understand what the question is though i mean what do you mean when is it evaluated like i if you're if you're wondering uh, uh, well i would say one thing in general if you are doing this general approach and you're trying to make an integer grid or a 2d array of uh, positional components um this isn't traditionally the way i would do it because at the end of the day, you don't actually need to calculate them at all. Because if you want to have a symmetrical grid of your infinite uh, plane, then all you have to do is 
divide by your grid size and round the values. So for example, if I have any position in my world, if I have, you know, vector position, you know, 3.5 and then for my X and six for my Y and then minus two for my Z, if I just um, round all those values out, I will be snapped to a single unit point grid just by the nature of calling mathf round to int because I'll just basically have taken those values and snapped them to the nearest integer value. And if I do that and then multiply by my uh, column size, I will automatically have every single value on any object in my game world. All I have to do is say map to grid, pass in a value, round them out to ints and multiply them by my grid size. And all of a sudden, every position in my entire world is already at an integer value. You don't need to like generate an integer grid array, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it made sense to me. And I think his problem too is that he was curious on why those are automatically rounding. And I think it's because he's multiplying by an integer. Oh, he's multiplying, multiplying by an integer instead of passing a float. Yeah, he might have round. actually, if you've got one side of the argument as an integer, it will presume you're doing an integer calculation around it. You, you need to expressly, you need to expressly have it as a float on one side. So you have to, to cast it as a float or put it into a float. But the, I think it's working, and he was curious on why it was working. Um, but it's essentially working because when it's multiplying, it's turning them into ints. It's rounding them into ints because one yeah, so, of them so is there's an integer. This is a concept called uh, implicit conversion. Okay. And you can look into it. You can actually create your own implicit conversions. Um, and so things will automatically say, like I said before, anytime something can be evaluated to another type, it can be used indistinguishably from the other type. So if I have a function which takes in an int and I'm going to pass in some value like a float, you can provide what's called an explicit conversion. And that's where you put a bracketed convert to int or whatever else. But depending on the context, if something knows it needs a certain type and it's automatically got an inbuilt implicit conversion, it will do it for you. So in a lot of cases, we're using floats and ints and it'll automatically round out where possible. But if it's multiplying, if you're multiplying an int by a float, it will often assume, oh, I'm multiplying by a float. I'm in float space right now. So I will now convert things to floats and work with floats. And sometimes when you're doing this sort of multiplying and dividing by multiple values of ints and floats, you might get weird values where something will either round or not round as you expect it to because you haven't balanced your equation based on the types. So you might have to like bracket it inside of it and go cast a float or do one F to ensure that one is as of type float before it does the calculation as opposed to just one, which will do it as an integer. So yeah, there's a lot of types and type conversion is a much bigger topic. Uh, but if you want to know more about it, look for um, implicit and explicit conversion. And you can actually create your own overload for that. That was a good example or good explanation. Um, there was another question. I was just going to hit oh well let me just jump in sorry my dogs just started going nuts right i see two dogs go walking by the front and everybody's just barking like crazy over there i can see i'm just kind of trying to get out the window you, um, you should set up the uh, the rtx voice we won't hear anything yeah oh i just i think there's just a door that's open somewhere or something i don't normally what i do is just say hey google play um disney music in the kitchen and then it starts playing <laughs> and then the dogs stop. They run off. To, yeah. Yeah. They, they get confused. It starts playing music and they're uh, doing whatever. <laughs> um, so there was a, a question on when you first start using, is it, uh, do you normally start using other people's code and building off of it? And I just wanted to hit this. I know there are some above I want to hit too, but I want to answer this because it's a definite yes. I mean, I think everybody generally starts that way. Like it's hard to understand or know what to write or kind of where to start. Just starting with other people's code or in uh, game mods even is a really, really good way to do it, I think. And just kind of building upon people's code and then searching for stuff too. Like I constantly still search for things and solutions on how to do things if I'm not sure how to do it. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I assume you totally agree that people should be building off oh, other people's 100%. code. hundred percent. Like, and it's some, some people think it, it, it doesn't even matter if you're talking about libraries, you're talking about single lines of code. Like there is stuff that I know that I've done at different points in my life. So for example, I have written and incremented through a binary stream reader and read multiple parts of a file, or I've done 
uh, XML parsing with at the XML document node. Now or I've done these at different points years ago, <laughs> but I will never remember the exact syntax for calling these particular functions. And so every time I do them, because I do them once every two years, I will Google C sharp XML document read file. Now I could probably sit there and puzzle it out again and remember it. But why would I do that when I know it exists? And I know okay. I, I've, I've taken the time at some point in my past to learn how it works, why it works, and what it does. I just don't remember all the lines of code. And so okay. oftentimes I will Google a problem and I will say, you know, do X in C sharp, grab the code, and either it's something I've done before and forgotten, or I don't know it and I will look at it. I will play with it. I'll try to see and figure out how it works. And then I will make a point of knowing that for next time. But you don't need to know how everything works off the top of your head. It, yeah, as long as you know you how to find things and you know either. how to understand things, you're fine. Yeah, you need to know how to, how to search, how to find results that are good and results that are bad, and how to ignore bad search results too. Like when you find a problem and you go search for something, don't just assume that the top Google search result is correct. Go through three or four, pick the one that makes the most sense, and then dive into the details. Like don't just... Go with the yeah. first thing and assume that it's right. It could be outdated. It could just be somebody giving bad advice or wrong advice or advice they no longer agree with. So I think it's a super important skill to be able to go through and debug and search for answers and find try yeah. out different things. There's only one time I would ever say taking other people's code is a bad idea. And that's when you take someone else's code and you place it in line and then just assume it does its job. I, I, I have no problem with anybody ever taking code from somewhere else as long as you play with it, at least run it a few times, pass in different values, mess with it, check what the edge cases do, and get comfortable with it. And it may sound silly, but I will often take the code I've gotten off some online source, and I'll just rename the variables a little bit. I will just sort of switch oh, yeah. this to a var or not to a var, or I will you know, move it into a different function or a different class, even if it's arbitrary, because it's mine now. I, I have taken the components, I've played with it, I've understood how it works, and I will just turn it into my code. And then I don't feel like I'm just gluing other things together. I'm taking information, learning from it, and then sort of spreading it throughout my code base and using it, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. Just renaming it and refactoring it. So it, I think it makes you understand the code more too, especially if it's a bit of code that like, you were a little bit lost on what it's doing. It's good to understand it. You may not understand it completely, but uh, the better understanding you have, I think the better it is. Uh, there were a couple other questions I'm to just quickly hit and then probably hop off. But um, there was one on, was he testing a health class? He said, added a test for testing a health class, but added instantiation of the prefab in the health class and the test stops working. Um, so you're probably just not doing it as a play mode test. So you need to set it up as a play mode test and probably yield on it and wait for that instantiation to happen. Uh, you may not ne you may not necessarily have to yield, but if you do it as a play mode test, you should still be able to instantiate it and have it do stuff. Now, if the object that you're creating is doing the instantiation in awake or something or in start, um, you'll probably want to yield one frame and then use the object after that. Um, but other than that, yeah, you should be totally fine. Uh, but you might want to test the prefab separately too. Um, as you're saying, should you bypass that or test the instantiation? I would probably test it and test um, without it. Test both Test both parts. Right? Test the health class with and without the prefab, if possible. Um, and then there was another question about should you follow Uncle Bob's advice and test as much as possible? I would say yes. I don't think everybody agrees with me. But um, I would say, yeah, I, I'm more and more convinced every day that testing as much as possible is, is the way to go. Um, and I don't know. There were there was was there any mm. other questions up there that I missed? There probably well, uh, were. Uh, just on on the Uncle Bob thing, I will say one thing is that he's very famously said um, he sees uh, test driven development as the equivalent of double entry bookkeeping for accountants, and he thinks it's his literal words are it's a prerequisite to um, craftsmanship as a programmer. He, he basically says mm. if you intend to be good at programming, you have to do it. Now, I wouldn't be that diehard, and I do think that unequivocally test-driven is the best way to write code, but I don't do it all the time, and I think that's the asterisk I would have put on it. Just because I agree with the principles doesn't mean I always feel it's practically the right thing to do. And I will say, though, 
his his belief is that you you should you should always strive for 100% code coverage and even though it's pretty much impractical to ever get that he even says in his own 15 year long prog project fitness he's at like 97% and that's sort of as far as he's gotten but he's still constantly striving for 100% um i would personally still take into account the pareto principle and so he says a test suite that doesn't aim for 100% is not worth having i would disagree and i would say as long as you test your critical path the 20% of effort you do to make sure that the most common cases work is still better than 90% of the developers I ever meet do. Yeah. And so while you probably should in an ideal world have an amazing test suite and always aim for 100%, I'm willing to take small victories. And if I can get people to be comfortable and just say, look, if you just write tests to ensure that the most common things that happen, happen as you expect, because you would be amazed how you'll write a whole load of code and something that you say, if is dead, dead equals true, you might have messed up something really simple and that's not what you think it is. And you'll end up going on a, you know, two hour, five hour search to find, find out why something's broken because you didn't check the true is true that you expect it to be. And so if I can get people comfortable with the idea of just writing tests as sanity checks to ensure that the most obvious things are in fact obvious things that both explain that documentation to new people, make it easy for you to learn and remember, and just verify that the obvious is the obvious, that 20% will save you 80% of the effort of debugging and hunting and searching and everything else. And if you get an edge case, then hit the edge case, write the test to verify it now does what you expect it to, patch the problem and move on. Your test suite will grow and start to cover more as you go and you'll start to get more comfortable with it. And you might find when you've got some free time and you're more comfortable, you'll actually enjoy writing extra tests and just covering edges and getting more comfortable with it. So I wouldn't say you have to be a diehard ultimate super test driven guy just make a point of trying and that's quite frankly more than i can ask from most people i yeah i 100 percent agree i think that shooting for 100 percent is great um shooting for anything is better than most people so you're you're better off and you're going to find all kinds of random stuff when you have a lot of tests in your project and you run them you're going to find that stuff that you would have never caught breaks right especially if your project is big it's, it's the things that you wouldn't think to even consider testing that you that you find out about that, that accidentally break. And that's where, where TDD really saves you. Um, there was a question too about JSON serialization with inheritance. I don't know or remember enough about it um, being a problem to think about it. Um, I, I've, the only I've reason never I would really... say it might be an issue is if you're using JSON utility, the Unity one, it just has a whole lot of problems with type parsing and it can't deal with dictionaries and it's a very fundamental version of json serializing it's basically good for reading um standard web request responses my guess is that he's deserializing it as the base class type though it's probably calling like deserialize on that base class instead of on the, the whatever it is it should be including any public fields i'm imagining what's more likely happening is this private fields that are not being included in the serializer because they're not marked as serializable or they're um, not being included for whatever reason because they're assumed to be no longer part of the parent object. Um, well, you're saying he, that it always gets the base class, but I'm not sure. No. I, I wish well, I, 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 I would I, say the short answer is try using JSON.net yeah. and there's specifically a, a JSON.net for Unity that's on the asset store. And I would imagine that'll probably solve most of your problems because it's just a far better and more robust serializer. Um, if you're still having trouble, then you'll have to look for more specific answers. Um, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that would probably solve your problem. Just use JSON.net for most things. Yeah, and I, I, I said I just don't usually have much inheritance on data that I'm serializing. In fact, yeah, I almost that's, never that's another do. good idea. I just don't do that either. I, like, as far as I'm concerned, you use inheritance on objects, not on data structures. Yeah, I've um, done it like, on data structures before. I just didn't like it because it always felt like it was good at first and then fell apart and I had to add extra stuff and things didn't work out right. So, Plus it just gets confusing because by definition, the data structure is meant to be a chunk of data. And if it's inherited, you're not seeing the data in your data structure yeah. when you open it. It gets confusing. Yeah, it's in that base um, class and then... Yeah. So, I mean, it may sound weird, but if you're trying to save out objects that are complicated enough to have a multiple hierarchy thing, consider having a get save data method that gives you out a nice clean object full of the fields that matter and learn how to reconstitute the object back from it. 
you're basically using what's called a flyweight pattern at that stage. You're taking a chunk of data that actually represents the sort of heart of it. What level is this creature? What weapon does it have? And a couple of other bits. You only need the ID of the weapon. You don't need the actual weapons, objects, and stats, and fields. And just take the, the chunk of data that represents what's important to root serialize and have the object give you that out to do stuff with it and then load it back into the object when you need to. So I wouldn't really rely on having this sort of actually trying to serialize a large complex series of nested objects. Just make it into something that's data that you need to save, spit it out, spit it back in. Makes sense. Uh, there was one last question I wanted to hit real quick, and then I got to get going because everybody pulled up and it's getting loud outside. We have been here uh, for a while too. It's been, it's been a long enough stream. So uh, there was on uh, health component. So just asking if you would have like an on, say you got an on died event on a health component, would you have it be a public static action or a public action? And I think that it depends dramatically on the use case of that health scenario. If this is like the well, and the things that are registering for this event. If this is something where all of these, like uh, there's some system that's just globally listening for things to die, um, doesn't care what they are really, or just, or just cares where they are or something, then uh, a static like on anything died event would be totally fine. But most of the time we care about um, a specific instance of a thing dying. So we, it would not be a static method and it would be, other things that are probably children or sub components of this health thing or related directly to this health thing that are listening in on it. So that would be where that differentiation would be for me. And like if it was a static one, it'd probably be like on any health diet or something is what I would name it. And it'd be only registered for things that care. Like it doesn't really care what it is. It's going to do the same thing, but maybe cares like where the position is or something um, like it's going to show a little visual or some, some, something like that. Um, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that. I assume somewhat similar. Um, I've gotten myself in trouble by having static things like on died when I try to have a helper function do something like, uh, oh, I just want to clear all the objects from the screen. All of a sudden, I'm firing off 50 died events because technically by killing it, I, they died. And that's not what I intended. Um, you know, scores are being calculated all because I just tried to like clean out some objects. So I try to avoid these sort of magic grab all things where possible. Um, so personally, I use a public event action died, and then I would have a private virtual void on died that would call that function. And that way I can extend it if I need to. That way it still acts as an event so I can have multiple listeners and no. I can if, decide to extend it from there. What about when you want to just register for all of them? You don't want to register for any specific one. You want to be registered for any of them dying. Um, you don't, like, you, you, whenever something dies, you want to do something. And, and you, how do you like to manage that and setting up all, that, um, I guess, that event or that set of um, events? Honestly, I, I try not to like even I mean, if it's, i it's feel like case. i want Don't to i usually find i wouldn't and, a, and if i did case. really really have to do something like that i would probably pass in some kind of uh collaborator that would be like the equivalent of a game system event object that would have a died method i could call and that way it all gets aggregated to one location okay. but i haven't decided what that is it's just like an, it's a null object pattern that receives all of those events and i can then later on decide here is where i will aggregate them and send it to a high score or i will save it to a text file or add them to my logger okay. that way i defer the question and i can figure out the answer later yeah and eventually it just becomes some system or management setup that eventually yeah. Stuff. yeah yeah that makes sense yeah and, and i think when you're doing the the more static ones like that, they tend to be short-lived stuff that eventually morphs into a bigger system a lot of the time or most of the time. Yeah, I, I will say the short answer, like if I was doing a quick prototype or a game jam game and I wanted the equivalent of that feature, I actually instead prefer to have a static list of whatever the type is. So I would have something called oh, okay. projectile or um, asteroid, and I would have a public static list of asteroid inside of asteroid. And then mm -hmm. in its constructor or its await function, I would say asteroids.add this. And then I would be able to, or well, I've called it all normally, because then I could say yeah, asteroids dot say, all, and I have I actually like self-managed list of all of those objects. And it will add and remove itself from the list in its enable and disable. And that way I effectively have this magical list at all times that yeah. always contains all of those objects. It's a horrible pattern that you shouldn't really do, but if you're doing something quick and dirty, it's a really, really nice way of having like the master list of these things. 
I've done the same thing because it, it works great for simple um, simple things. It, it just falls apart when you get into scene loading and stuff, right? Yeah. You load a different scene. I mean, then you start having inheritance and you're like, well, what if I want all of the NPCs, yeah. but then all of the enemies and then all of the player characters and all of a sudden it's like, ah, this doesn't do all of those features I want. Yeah, but it's certainly useful. And yeah, it's just like a static list of whatever the type is named all. Yeah, just adding it. I've done, that's funny. They even name it the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I to be honest, I I'll have to be honest. I stole that from XNA 2.0. It was part of a tutorial years ago on, that on how to make it. That where I got it from too. Asteroids <laughs> clone. <laughs> yeah, I, I were doing XNA games for Windows Mobile and Xbox. Um, I may have uh, that may have been where that originated for me. It probably is. <laughs> cool. Well, all right, man. I think uh, I need to get going, and we've been on for a couple hours, and it's fun um yeah it's been a pleasure it's, I, I always have fun whenever we do this yeah it's a blast and i just talk about code and get to, get to have a lot of people come in here and just ask questions and stuff um i'd love to do it again sometime soon uh, i want to say thanks to everybody coming out uh, i'm sure we'll go soon and everybody should probably leave a comment for jason to start his youtube channel and then we can like put the link to it in the description when he starts his youtube channel and he finally now? gets around to it. When will he just get around to doing it? God, people uh, keep telling him to. Just never <laughs> but all right, I'm gonna yeah, we'll wrap it up. Get a head out, and um, it's good talking to everybody. Good talking to you again, Jason. And I'll see everyone soon. Good luck, everybody.